So uh, first here we have Maya Perkins. She's the executive director of Bay Area Forward. Maya has over 15 years experience in community law, nonprofit sector and government, and approximately 10 years of which she served within the County of San Mateo in the Board of Supervisors offices as a senior legislative aide. A child of East Palo Alto, Maya had, Maya had early exposure to community building as her family was instrumental in the self-determination of East Palo Alto residents to become a city. As a graduate of Mount Holyoke and a fellow seven sisters graduate, <laughs> 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 um, Santa Clara University uh, Law School, Maya has first-hand experience working on housing, transportation, criminal justice, the environment, health, and education. So welcome, Maya. Thank you. This is Mila Zelka. She is the founder and board president of Bay Area Forward. Mila Zelka works to cultivate collaborative relationships that generate solutions for today's challenges and help shape tomorrow's future. Her background is in housing advocacy and social entrepreneurship, where her ventures have combined architectural design, strategic partnerships, and socially responsible investing to help communities in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mila is the community ambassador for Palantir Technologies, the Palo Alto-based software company. In her civic life, Mila serves on the Santa Clara County Roads Commission and the Palo Alto Public Art Commission, among other volunteer efforts. Mm -hmm. Welcome. So I'd like to turn it over to you. I should mention I'm also a member of my local League of Women Voters. There's a lot of amazing <laughs> <laughs> people here. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Um, I was going to share a little bit of our origin story and then why I can take it from there. Um, but I want to also thank this group. I came and spoke maybe about a year, year and a half ago. Um, so it's nice to revisit and share um, how we've grown and what we're working on today. Um, I uh, had the opportunity to join that board. We bought a piece of property off of the Rastrodero Road and we tried to build 60 units of low-income senior affordable housing. Um, it was new. It was a new experience for me. I hadn't um, any familiarity with tax credit projects, and so you know I, I watched kind of the whole process unfold. And the project was approved unanimously by our city council, but there was a group of residents who were concerned about the project. And what started out with some, you know, valid skepticism about the project, and, you know, how can we make it better, actually snowballed into a referendum with 3,000 people signing it and rescinded the approval for the project. So the project was called Maybell, and it went to ballot, and it was called, that ended up being Measure D, and we lost at the ballot box. And I think for me, as you know, a resident of Palo Alto, I was born and raised there, and um, you know, having come back, wanting to improve my community, um, and being a volunteer on that board, I found it really frustrating that I didn't have um, you know planning language and legal language that I could easily describe zoning to other community members. And you know, I I even had an architecture background, and I had <laughs> some struggle with that. Um, and, and I think once you get into a highly politicized situation, that's when people are hiring political consultants and all of that. So really being able to relate to people about you know, the built environment in our neighborhoods was a, a, a very difficult experience. And so in the wake of that ballot measure, a group of us got together and created um, what is called Palo Alto Forward. And it, was, it is an advocacy group for more housing and transportation options in Palo Alto. Um, I, I think out of that experience, we had friends from other communities approach and say, well, we want to create similar resident-led groups in our city. And six months after Palo Alto Ford got off the ground, Imagine Menlo formed. And six months after that, Redwood City Ford formed. And I, th I think by that point, um, I didn't feel like it was appropriate for me to show up in these cities and say, hey, <laughs> why don't you try X, Y, and Z? Um, so I, I basically stood back from Palo to Florida and removed myself from the decision-making process there, but made myself available to help residents who approached us. And uh, when I say us, a group of volunteers and um, and basically just provide tips and advice. That adventure has led us to a full-blown organization. 
So we are now with a special project fund of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, and we were fortunate enough to be able to raise funds to hire an executive director. We, we take money only from family foundations. We don't um, accept money from developers or tech, and so that really helps us protect residents who are advocating on these things. So, pleased to introduce Maya to you. Um, she came on board in November. Thank you um, again for having us. It's really nice to be here. I actually um, lived in Los Altos um, when I was little, and so it's nice to come back and be here. <laughs> Maybe I'll drive by my old house. <laughs> yeah. <still> there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, as as Mila said, we um, we support community based um, organizations that are interested in uh, more housing and transportation options, and um, that is we do some other things, but that's the part of the work that really excites me, as Shali said, I um, grew up mostly in East Palo Alto, and we moved there when it was in the process of becoming a city. And so that idea that the residents um, want to be able to have a voice in, in their government and self-determination is just a really um, central part of, of how I was raised and, and what I believe in. Um, what I have subsequently worked on in um, both my, my private life and my, my um, work life. Um, so for, for different groups, um, community groups, um, Mila has been basically a one-woman shop um, <laughs> for a long time. But what we've done is support them, let them know about different policy initiatives that have maybe coming up in their city. Um, so saying, hey, this is going before your city council. Um, it might be something that you want to weigh in on. Or your planning commission is set to talk about this in a month. So you know we have to watch the agendas and, and make sure we know um, when it's coming out. And then also giving um, groups a perspective as to what that might mean, helping them interpret it. Say, if the city council votes this way, this is some of the impacts it might have. Um, we also have groups that might want to initiate something and say, hey, we want to bring this to our city council. This is a change we want our city to make. And so we can help them navigate through that process. And we can also say, have you thought about this consequence? It might be unintended. Did you know that um, you know, in this other community when they passed this, here's some of the things that happened as a result that they weren't expecting. Um, so we can bring a certain level of, um, of policy expertise to groups that may not have, know about what's gone on in the region or in the state or in the country. Um, we also have groups where we help them with their newsletters um, or organizing their systems. So we can also um, offer a certain level of technical support um, to, to groups. Um, and every single time, and they're at night and not everybody can make it. And so we can work with folks on how to get that group of people, how to, how to you know, have a strong um, governance, a strong steering committee, but also have a strong bench of people that maybe don't want to be involved and go to every single meeting, but are willing to come out and, and support. Um, so, so part of what we do is, is work on um, helping folks to, to organize their, their members um, and, and show up in the way that is most effective for the organization, but also most feasible for the individual members. Um, we also work on regional issues, and I know some of you were able to attend our teacher housing um, conversation that we had last Thursday <coughs> so we had over a hundred teachers um, come to um, Gunn High School and talk about the issues that they faced as teachers who any place else would make really good salaries you know if you look at their salary on paper you think oh, oh that's a good salary and then it's but what what does that do for you in this region um, it's really difficult 
in this region to live on a teacher's salary and so um, and find housing I should say on a teacher's salary um, so we had teachers from both San Mateo County and Santa Clara County um, come in and talk about their struggles there was a single mom who had two kids and was at one point living in a den with one of her child one of her children in a bedroom apartment um, she ended up being qualified for a, a special subsidy which is which is really unusual it's not a government subsidy it was a private company that had been willing to subsidize housing in the <coughs> specifically for teachers um, and that's and that's basically kind of a, a story about really creative financing model um, and this this program that she's in is on an individual basis but but with teachers they don't qualify for a traditional subsidized housing because they make too much money and um, they don't make enough money to really be able to compete for market rate housing so they're they're stuck in the middle um, and a lot of people as as you know are in that same situation as the teachers so teachers are about uh, sort of a symbol um, representative of what so many workers in um, in this region are, are facing um, so we've been working on teacher housing and, and how to come up with creative financing structures so that teachers have a place to live people who make income similar to teachers also have a place to live um, we have also been working on transportation issues and so a bunch of our member groups are interested in um, transportation obviously but also the Denmark rail and so um, I, I sit on the um, the San Mateo get us moving San Mateo County stakeholders advisory group <laughs> which is called gum <laughs> get us moving um, and um, and representing our groups, basically taking the information from these meetings and bringing it back to the groups that are interested in, in learning about it. Um, and that's you know what what we do. Some of the groups might be able to send a member, but not all groups have the capacity to do that. You know, the meetings are, are during the work day, um, and a lot of folks don't have that kind of flexibility. Um, so. Can I add something? Yes, there? please. The, the groups themselves vary tremendously, mm -hmm. and they, they reflect the political realities where they live, and they also reflect decisions that they make on their own. So, you know, I mentioned Palo Alto Ford, for example. They have very clear ideas because of the way they've chosen to put their steering committee together. Um, the group in Redwood City looks different from the group in Sunnyvale, looks different from the group in Brisbane. And so I, I, I just want to put out there that if you look at any one group or have heard about any one particular group, take pause before you make assumptions about how they came to the beliefs that they have or the agenda that they're working on. And I think, you know, the role that Bay Area Forward has is to help them provide resources but ultimately it's their decisions for their community and so it's not for us to really even steer their direction we offer education and you know policy strategy advice but ultimately you know it's their responsibility accountability to participate in their own communities um, and so I think even if you look at Melmo Park, we have two groups there, and they have very different ideas about housing. Uh, they, they both would like to see more housing supply added, but one is very concerned that a lot of subsidized units have been added in one particular neighborhood, and they're kind of done with that. They want to see the other side of town do their fair share. <laughs> and then the other group says, well, we should generally be thinking about all this stuff you know and so they have a more genteel attitude about things um, and the, their, their educational programming you know they wanted to put on a 
a, a social about transportation at the British Bankers Club next to Kepler's. You know, so so it's a very different style. You know, um, and 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 I think you know the the way that Bounds Mountain View works is very different from um, is some of the things that residents in Cupertino are dealing with, and a lot of this also reflects the political climate. You know, is it an election year? Who's thinking about doing what? <laughs> Who wants to be on a commission? We don't, we don't really weigh in. We can't weigh in on endorsing any candidates, and we're not in the business of cultivating those kinds of leaders. We're interested in cultivating sort of the group leadership so that there's a strong bench of like uh, community action. And, um, you know, I'm pleased to see a lot of people from the league here. Um, we've tried very hard to have our groups partner with the league. And so that way, you know, if someone's a member of the league and they do an event co-sponsored by one of the local groups, you're not stuck with this, oh my gosh, I did something with this group. Who is this group, you know? Um, you know, the, the league has people from all stripes as members. And, and so, you know, it's really how do you build bridges with different institutions. Um, and, and to that end, Bay Area Forward is actually part of a network of institutions. Um, so, you know, our focus is housing and transportation and creating options. And what those options look like, as I said, are, um, there's a lot of variety. But there's also other institutions, some are faith-based, some are secular, like Congregation Beth Am is one of the institutions, or St. Cyprian's Catholic Parish in Sunnyvale. Um, California Teachers Association, we partner together so that um, if there's an action we all want to do together, we can form those alliances without anyone worried that they're going to get asked to join a group or anyone in a group worried that they're going to get proselytized to, you know. So, um, so that's sort of meeting people where they're at on a particular issue as long as it's not you know, we're good, everybody else can go home. <laughs> and, and there are some people who feel that way, and that's their right, but we're interested in bringing kind of everybody into the mix, and so if at the end of the day, we all self-determine that we all feel that way, then we, you know, we know what kind of a community we live in. Um, we think our hunch is that not everybody feels that way, and we'd like to make room for others. Um, and so that's why we're doing this work. And we thought we'd maybe open it up to you guys. It's a Q&A on the agenda, but happy to just have like an informal conversation. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead. I have a question as to what have some of these cities done for housing that you can point to that was a success? Sure. Um, well, you know, I, I can point to Palo Alto Ford because they've been around the longest and they embarked on a series of educational programs um, talking about what are accessory dwelling units, um, what is tiny houses, what, how, does, how do you fund tax credits, like a series of these kinds of topics so that, um, you know, it coincided with the state had a new legislation around ADUs or granny units or in-law units. And so then the city council had to make a decision about whether they, how they were going to sort of uh, comply with that state law. And because of that work, Palo Alto Forward was in a position to have a lot of informed residents talking about the pros and cons of that. And so the city council actually went beyond what the state required in trying to make it easier for people to build these ADUs. Now, they also put fees on it that are cost prohibitive, <laughs> like all this other stuff. So, you know, it's not like a huge game-changing thing, but when you, when you think about a community that, like, historically has not been building units, that was a shift there. Um, I, I think if you look at Balanced Mountain View, they have had multiple years of talking about housing supply, and it culminated with several people being elected to council because the electorate overall had an understanding of the housing crisis, 
And most recently, I think it was November or December, the North Bayshore neighborhood was, you know, approved like 9,000 plus units. Um, now, some of these groups need to pivot a bit and talk more about transportation and, you know, how do you do traffic mitigation. Um, but those are, in, you asked about housing, that's sort of where some of those groups have, have fallen. Mm -hmm. So has Palo Alto done any large apartment building, like you mentioned the 60 unit before, have they built anything like that? No, since Palo Alto started, the one thing that has happened was the saving of the Buena Vista mobile home park, mm -hmm. which supervisor right. city in red. And so Palo Alto mm -hmm. Ford participated in that and endorsed that. But now we're looking at, um, there's a, a project on the corner of El Camino and Page Mill where uh, the developer, it's a private development, the developer wants to experiment with um, very little parking. And so how do you create you know, uh, transportation incentives for the residents to use that. It's a former VTA site, very close to Caltrain. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. It was approved by the Planning and Transportation Commission just the other night. Um, and then we'll see what happens at the Fry's site, the Fry's electronic site. Um, that's just the very beginning of community engagement. Um, and you know, there's a few affordable housing projects and also Semidian just came out with saying, let's use county land to house teachers from five different districts, including Los Altos School District and the Mountain View Los Altos District. So, you know, we'll see. I, 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 building buildings takes a, a long time. Um, but I think, you know, raising sort of the level of awareness, thinking about what solutions are out there, depending on how active a community is on those things will happen at different rates. Redmond City, you know, their, their general plan was approved several years ago and they started building a bunch of really big buildings. And so there are a lot more housing options in Redmond City, but hand in hand with that are still traffic issues. And so there are some residents there who naturally are concerned like all these build buildings are going up, my community is changing, what does that mean, can we work on traffic? So we'll see how the Redwood City Forward Group works on the Dumbarton Corridor. They on their own did a permit parking program uh, in a residential community. So they're, they're spending more time thinking about transportation lately. Yes. What's your perspective on the Grand Boulevard Initiative, you know, on El Camino Real? And you know, some people say, well, all that housing there is going to create traffic. But then if you have housing close to jobs, it might reduce traffic. Where, where do you stand on that? Well, we don't really take a stand on these things. <laughs> well, what's your perspective? We, we help you How guys you see that? take a stand. Okay. Um, well, feel free to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so our, our model being based on um, what what residents in those communities would like to see um uh but i can say that a lot of times there are really creative things that can happen when housing is close to transportation and so um you know with the grand boulevard if a housing complex apartment complex is built there um, and there are opportunities to um, have reduced parking requirements, and um, which which will reduce car ownership or can reduce car ownership, encourage people to take transit. One of the proposals that's on the table for um, housing in Palo Alto now it has reduced parking requirements. Um, folks get um, uh, a subsidy for Lyft and Uber, and um, they have, get transit passes, and I don't remember the exact details, but, but there's some really creative things when um, something is near transportation. Um, so I, I think that there, that provides a really cool opportunity. Of course, it's the devil is in the details, um, how these things are done. But um, generally, if, if there's a, a resident group 
that is interested in housing and transportation and, and wants to provide more options in their community, then, then we would help them work on that if that's, if that's what they wanted. I, I think if you look at like bus rapid transit, um, some of you might be familiar that communities along El Camino were thinking about bus rapid transit recently. And it's a mixed bag. Right, like in theory, it works great in other countries, <laughs> and in general, like if you have transportation housing along a transportation corridor, yes, especially among the millennial generation, we're seeing lower car ownership. That's not necessarily true when you get away from a transportation corridor, and so because El Camino has had, had, was developed the way that it was for many years, it'll be a bit of a chicken and the egg to get it to something working seamlessly. Um, and so I think that's why you saw up and down the corridor, the El Camino corridor there, communities voting very differently about something like bus rapid transit. And so if you were to do that, I would guess you probably would have a suggestion right away because we're we're all still we drove a car here. You know, like we're still using a car. Now, now, I, I hope that changes. I use the train a lot more than I used to. I actually, I've been using the bus a lot more than I used to, but, um, and, and that change may like happen, uh, the, the, the curve of that may change significantly at, you know, at a point where we're not anticipating it. But, so I, I would say like generally we're inclined to agree that trans, housing near transit is a great idea. But I, I think going into it, not being Pollyannish about it, and just saying, like, hey, you know your community. If you can imagine what the, this version of the Grand Boulevard looks like in your section, you're going to know where the difficulties are going to be. And so instead of uh, getting angry right away about it, how can we brainstorm to mitigate that? What can we do to shift it so that we're not always dealing with the chicken or the egg, but we're willing to take some risks and try some things? So. Uh, you, oh, oh, I'm sorry. So I just wanted to say, Come back. in response to Liz's question, I don't know if you're aware, Liz, but before the Maybell project and before um, Palo Alto Forward, um, Palo Alto has built a, a large number of all affordable um, developments. They have a lot. Yeah, this, I think there's over 700 units yeah. of it. But it had always been sort of done just yeah. it's so so uh, well and quietly right. that uh, no one even knew that they were living next to a, right. you know, right. low income housing. And it's wonderful because the folks who were in those buildings got to integrate into the community. Um, but, you know, I think the way that the tax credit system works and the high cost of land, you end up having projects that are fairly dense now, whether it's for profit or non profit. And so, like from an architectural perspective, that's sometimes not very palatable, right? And so, and I think that's why the missing middle for teachers is kind of interesting because what other kinds of architecture typology can we do so that we don't dislike what we're building? You know, yeah. so I wanted to ask a question because you um, mentioned that there was some kind of finance and creative financing for this in the middle, and I was wondering if you could expand on that. Yeah, so that's that is what is being discovered right now. So, so <laughs> more will be revealed later. <laughs> I'm getting involved. <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the things that um, in uh, uh, San Mateo County. Um, the community college district um, built um, housing for workforce. And so they built it on, um, on land from the school district um, and um, actually have a really cool program where uh, the people living there part of, oh, I, I'm, I might be messing up the details, but I think that there's something where when they leave, they've been saving money um, so it's easier for them to get a down payment. Um, so there are, there are all sorts of creative things, you know, private companies, the, the program I was talking about where the, the teacher um, was able to live with her two children, um, a private company is, is subsidizing the, the rent. Um, so it's, 
that I think is a is a difficult and expensive in the long run. Um, but one of the things that Supervisor Sumidian is doing right now is is looking at creative financing structures. And he has a project on one piece of land that could benefit five districts. But you know, in addition to the county providing the land and him asking the districts, hey, can you, you know, put some skin in the game? He's going to need to raise money to build the thing. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, you know, it's it's one thing to have a lot of electeds going with their vision for a piece of property in their districts, asking everybody for money. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about this particular project is that um, because the land is to serve workers from a different agency, a different entity, he's opening it up so that he can actually think about the financing differently as well. And it coincides with a conversation in the philanthropic community about how do we have revolving funds that help create innovative projects, not just sort of build what we all already, already have been doing. And so, you know, we'll see in the next year, hopefully a few months, um, what comes out in the philanthropic community because uh, there's several that are starting to get together um, to create a regional <coughs> housing innovation fund. But in order to tap into that money, you have to think differently about your project. It's not just to get your thing done in your area, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think there's some challenge. There's a lot of districts who think, okay, we have some surplus land, let's build housing for our own. There's districts that don't have surplus land, so they don't have that option. Uh, not every teacher wants their landlord to be their boss. <laughs> I wouldn't want that. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, you know, not every teacher wants to live with all their coworkers in a building. You know, I think a lot of us can relate to those concerns. So this project starts to mix that up a bit, um, and and I, I think that it. It's not just about teachers. If the financing comes together for this in a creative way, it's potentially scalable for lots of different kinds of workforce, as Maya was saying earlier. Right? So along the lines of the creative housework. Sorry, sorry. Barry, do you want to? Sorry. Okay. He's next. <laughs> <laughs> um, along the lines of the creative housing solution, do you have any examples of mixed housing solutions? Where you're more interested in senior housing mm -hmm. as well. Right? And so seniors living with like a mixed community. I know there's a lot of that in Europe, but if you know what we're going to do here, that's pretty Um, I don't know of anything that's been built yet. Um, maybe you do. I, I'm, I'm, the example that I know of is mixed income housing. And so um, there there are examples of, um, of uh, housing sites where there are people of various income levels, so they'll have some, you know, very low, the low, um, the low market rate mixed in um, in in rental units, and um, and that the, the cool thing about that model is that if somebody starts to make more money, then they don't have to physically move, and so their rent will basically just continue to go up as their income goes up. Because one of the, the struggles of people who live in subsidized housing is that they say, oh my gosh, if I get that raise, I'm gonna lose my, lose my housing, and then they'll be part of the missing middle. <laughs> you know, so, so they kind of, kind of have to watch their income to make sure they don't make too much. But, um, but the cool thing about, about uh, mixed income units, the opportunity there, is they actually can physically stay in their unit. They don't, they don't leave. They just continue to get their raises and, and continue to get better, and then eventually they can move up to market rate, which which they have faith that they can actually afford because the rent has slowly gone up to to match it. Um, so that is that is one creative model that I know exists. Um, there is a um, there is one um, building that has that model in East Palo Alto that is is really nice. It's in the same um, kind of gated-ish community with um, expensive market rate homes. And so it's a very nice, um, very nice apartment units um, close to a park. 
and um, and close to larger homes that go for you know over a million dollars. Um, and it's cool because all the kids all just are together, and it's just it's it's very integrated. And then St. Mark's Episcopal in Santa Clara, they have a proposal. They they'd like to do. They have a larger piece of property with a sort of older classrooms, and they would like to build uh, affordable senior housing and on the ground floor have a preschool. So it's not the same as having family housing mixed with senior housing, but they're looking to do something based on what they've learned about in, in Europe. Uh, so I've heard uh, that we're kind of on the start of the evolution process of considering workforce senior housing in communities. Uh, I've also heard that uh, there isn't uh, enough models to say this one works and this one doesn't. It's, it's relevant to your community, okay? Uh, and I've heard um, that like San Francisco is developing without parking, and other communities are taking that concept up, which forces some residents to use mass transit. And then I heard uh, when that is implemented, uh, there are subsidies for Uber and Lyft and things of that nature. My question, and I've heard it around the room this morning, is um, finance. Right, it all comes down to following money, right? So, are there any models that, or is it still conceptual as to how the finance happens? For example, it would be either the developer paying or it would be a public program. Um, our experience in Los Altos is public programs don't work too well uh, and they've been shut down over the last 15 years. So, when that's considered, then is it a public-private cooperative that works? Or have you gone that far? Um, well, I know, I'd be wearing my work hat if I answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the, so just to be clear, I, I, at the tech company where I work, I explore transportation, local policy. And so what we've been following are transportation management associations. They're like co-ops. And so Santana Row has one, Mountain View has one, where Google, Intuit, LinkedIn, they pay in, but then they provide a free shuttle for all Mountain View residents. And then Palo Alto <coughs> has one in the research park that Stanford pays and gives to anybody who works in the research park. And then the downtown in Palo Alto has one where my company, along with Google and IDEO and the city, put money in the pot. And so that one is a it's a public private partnership. So is the Mountain View one. They get money from the city of Mountain View. And on their own, as you say, the local ones don't really work that well. They're kind of rinky dink and it ends up being like the city government just kind of keeps them on a lifeline, but they don't necessarily have the ridership and all that. <coughs> but there's talks about about how can we actually do some combinations of them so that they can be more sub-regional? Um, so, you know, Google is involved with both the downtown Palo Alto one and the Mountain View one, and although they say they're not in the transportation business, <laughs> they have a footprint, right? Stanford, similarly, they've got a great Marguerite shuttle system, but they're like, the envy of anyone who goes over there to visit. You have a shuttle every 10 minutes to take you free places. But you know, they're not like VTA to just show up and solve it for us. However, they are growing and they're gonna to have to mitigate those growths in some way. So anyway, so my, my day job is sort of like exploring with other tech companies, what could we do to put money in a pot and there are a fair number of local electeds who are like, you know, we've been trying to do this on our own with our local programs, and it's slow. We're not seeing the adoption that we'd like to, but we've seen hints that it might. So I'm tracking that. We'll see what happens in the next year or two. It's not gonna be a sea change, but um, again, it's kind of the chicken or the egg thing. Like you, who can experiment and really public entities don't have the risk tolerance or the money to make big experiments, right? And so can we lean on, lean on the private sector to have them take the risk? Like if Stanford bombs 
I'm creating a shuttle, well, we won't, you know, hate them and knock them out of office. <laughs> you know, we'll tease them, you know, but there's, there's family, they're doing their own thing. But a, a, a city council really can't take those kinds of risks. So as, as our region begins to add more density, there's an inherent conflict that I'm seeing up and down the peninsula, and the, 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 the Grand Boulevard is a good example, that arguably along El Camino is a great location for density. But you go behind those frontage properties, and typically it's older single family dwellings. So my question is, what strategies are your groups using to begin or are they using strategies to begin to resolve those inherent conflicts on the edges of these transitional areas? Or does the decision get sort of worked out at a city council meeting, which is almost too late at that point? I mean, one thing that's, that's you know, we've been using the, the um, term missing middle to talk about um, humans um, making you know, not enough money for um, for market rate housing, but too much for subsidized. But there's also housing, which there's a term missing middle housing, um, and and that's um, you know not a large apartment complex, but also not a single family home. And so, townhomes, um, duplexes, triplexes. Um, little courtyards where you kind of drive in and there's like, you know, three or four cute little homes with a shared courtyard and, and so there's, there's that type of concept um, where it's, where may work better um, for some places. So if you look at the Grand Boulevard, it might be um, apartment complexes up front but directly behind it is not single family homes, but it's that missing middle, like a transition into the single family <coughs> homes in the neighborhood. Now, of course, a lot of everything is already really built out, so it's not like there's these huge chunks of blocks that like are empty that we can like add missing middle housing, <laughs> if only. Um, but but I think that, that that concept can be thought about as, as things are being built. And so there might be areas where um, missing middle housing makes more sense, um, bungalow style um, fourplexes rather than um, uh, like large apartment units. Um, and, and where those conversations are taking place, I think you know, it's, it can be really useful when those are taking place in, in community settings. And so um, in, in house meetings or coffee shop meetings of our, of our community groups. And so when residents get together and talk about what they would like to see and, and can be united and come to a consensus amongst their group and then bring in those folks that um, we had talked about earlier, maybe they are not the people who wanna to come to every meeting, but they're the friends and say, oh, my friend's really involved in this, this group and I, you know, she drags me sometimes, you know? So bringing in those folks and then, and then that group of people goes to the council meeting um, and says, hey, this is, this is what we want. Um, so it, it's, and, and it could even be before the council meeting, reaches out to a city council member or, or one of the planners in the city and says, hey, we've gotten together, can we sit down and have a conversation with you? This is, this is what we want. Um, so that when the, the council meeting comes, um, what the group is asking for is not a surprise. And it might even be that the, the council report, the staff report, reflects the conversations that the group has been having on the sidelines with the council members so that the, the council, um, you know, obviously not Brown Act violation, but you know, a, a member is able to help the group um, give voice to the community concerns. And out of all the groups, I would say Sunnyvale and Redwood City are really the only groups that um, are thinking about that specific issue right now. Um, because really, they're volunteers, right? They're residents that have busy lives and lots of other institutions that they're a part of. And so they, each, each city resident group makes a set of decisions on what their priorities are for the year. 
And um, so, you know, we, we can say, look, there's all this stuff going on, like Santa Clara, Grand Boulevard talks are gonna really impact you this year. But right now, they're just building their group, right? You know, <laughs> they're learning about what is affordable housing. What is the difference between tax credit projects? And, I, and that's where they're at. So, so I, I think it really, it really depends. So it, it's, again, it's not, we're not like an advocacy group coming in with an agenda about any one of these like major sweeps. We, you know, <coughs> we have an agenda so far as like, we'd like to see more options, but what people think those options can look like is, is open. Um, there are other groups like Silicon Valley at Home, SV at Home, um, Transform, Greenbelt Alliance. There's you know lots of well-known regional advocacy groups that take a stand on a particular uh, initiative and come in and talk to residents about that stuff. So, yes, Joe. Yeah, um, you were a little bit ago you talked about uh, how the board is spending a lot of time on education. So, what have you been? What have you seen that's most effective? in education that's resulted in you know people coming to the council meetings and having a constructive discussion instead of a real polarized you know, for or against? Um, two things, they, I mean, they, they've had guest speakers come in, much the same this community has had guest speakers come in. Um, and actually I've looked at your roster and a lot of the same guest speakers. <laughs> so like the Parallax who coined the term missing middle, you know, the, the Dan and Karen Parallax Berkeley, you know, come in and talk about what is the missing middle. Um, but then, um, and they have those open. And so, um, by observation in, in the RSVP list, I see community members on very different sides of the growth conversation participating in that. And they're not volatile meetings. You know, people are learning, asking questions together. But then the other thing that the groups do is that they have conversations with each other where they make room for story and that's really important so um, the teacher housing is an example of that where there was a half an hour to 40 minutes to hear teachers in their own words talk about it um, many of our groups participated in the on the table series um, that the Silicon Valley Community Foundation did for last November and like the Palo Alto you asked about Palo Alto you know, they could have had their own on the table and called it a day, um, but what they did was they partnered with the League of Women Voters of Palo Alto and with Congregation Beth Ong, and these three very different institutions um, got together at Lucy Stern and had 10 tables of 10 and deliberately had each table mixed with who was part of which institution. And so, um, that was, you know, that was a way of like hearing from someone you wouldn't normally talk to or talk about housing. Um, you might see them at the dog run, but maybe you haven't been talking about housing anytime. So I think I think making time and space for for people to really just share their experience um, goes a long way to break down divisiveness. I think we have time for one more question. He's the lucky question. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and wondering in the strategies, we, you know, we quite easily lump affordable housing into a thing. And then pretty immediately when you start to talk about answers, you're talking about specific strategies for specific groups. Um, in this education process, um, would it be helpful and how would you go about breaking the problem down? I made a list of six separate groups, target groups, with very separate needs, very separate community influences. Does that help? How do you think about the, the problem in terms of specific target communities, target groups? I'm just thinking this might be I am. Sure. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, that's where, um, so like I mentioned earlier, we're part of a, a broad-based organization, much the way you guys are, but it's for the region. And so, we make time for house meetings. And so if you're thinking about, let's say, workforce housing, who's who's the lucky subgroup that's gonna get included? You know, um, we in this room may all have ideas about who's the most deserving or whatever, but it, that gets, goes down a dicey road. And so 
um, just really making time to meet with them in various settings for house meetings, and then have a panel discussion where you're bringing, you know, one person from each of those groups to talk about it. Because I think the real question for all of us is, is this our shared concern? You know, and so, yes, you'll have many deserving people who would like help, um, but thinking about a strategy of not just helping them right now, but being part of a larger solution. That's why the Simonian project is, is fascinating because he could help 50 to 100 teacher families and then be done with it. But he is open to letting his project be an example of a bunch of people coming and talking about it. So at our meeting, we didn't just have public school teachers, we had private school teachers, and we had early childhood educators in the room. They make even less <laughs> teachers. So, you know, who is deserving is not the right, you know, is not the question, but just holding space for that and how do we set up solutions that could help everybody at some point. So I, I don't know if that really helps, but I, I think having yeah. that house meeting model. Yeah. I was thinking about something very different and thinking in terms of watching a set of surveys that were done here talking about the downtown vision. Uh, and I noticed an interesting shift in the way the surveys were being worded. Mm -hmm. uh, very early surveys were talking about affordable housing projects. Mm -hmm. And later surveys are talking about uh, workforce housing, rental workforce housing. So all of a sudden, mm -hmm. by just changing the terminology to, to, so that people could start to picture a particular group with a particular uh, type of characteristics and a particular needs and benefits, you shifted the conversation completely from we don't want any of that in our backyard to, huh, yeah, maybe we should. But on the other hand, if you had said we're going to install a parking lot for RVs, you might not have got the same. And yet, yeah. it's a similar problem that exists alongside this one. Yeah, the, the, the word affordable means different things to different people. Yes. So technically, when you talk about affordable housing here, you're talking about capital A tax credit projects. Yeah. Although that even now is switching, shifting because of measure A. So much money was put towards creating projects for the formerly homeless. So 750 million out of the 950 million that you know, will go towards that. So you might, if you just say affordable housing, you might have members of the community who say, oh my God, I don't want homeless people living next door to me. And it's like, well, they're deserving <coughs> too, but without even going down that road, you know, um, like let's talk about affordability in general and figure out who we're talking to and so that we're not getting everybody's shackles up right, you know, then we understand the problem and can look at each project for its merits when it's time. Thank well, you. thank you so much for coming today. Can we go on your website and send that for Follow us on Facebook. <laughs> That's really it. We're cheerleading what our like, different groups are doing. If you guys are doing anything, happy to cheerlead what you guys do, share pictures. Um, contact mine if you have any idea they want to have us uh, participate in the conversation. And to your point, and as we adjourn this meeting, the Community Coalition is looking for one of the speakers to bring to educate our community exactly what we were talking about. So please, everybody, stay tuned and watch your emails for future meetings and more exciting guest speakers. So thank you so much. <laughs>